Live coverage of Ron Paul from Charleston, South Carolina, here on C-SPAN. pulpit series event. Please take a moment to silence your cell phones and other electronic devices. Faculty, staff, students, and honored guests, on behalf of the Department of Communications Bully Pulpit Series, I welcome you to the College of Charleston, founded in 1770 and in the heart of Charleston's historic district. We're honored to host this town hall event with presidential candidate and congressman Ron Paul. <laughs> Congressman Paul's remarks, we will open for questions from the audience. Before moving forward, I would like to thank the many individuals and parties involved in making this event possible. It is through your support that we are able to achieve our purpose of bringing presidential candidates to the College of Charleston to participate in a dialogue with members of our campus and Charleston communities. Present at our nation's founding, the College of Charleston is pleased and honored to hear from one of the candidates seeking American presidency, Congressman Ron Paul. Congressman Paul is the fourth presidential candidate to speak in this nonpartisan series on political communication this season. Thanks to the generous support of the Office of the President, we will hear about the many issues important to Congressman Paul, as well as have the opportunity to ask Congressman Paul about issues important to us. Dr. Ron Paul was born and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He graduated from Gettysburg College and the Duke University School of Medicine before serving as a flight surgeon in the United States Air Force during the 1960s. While serving in Congress during the late 1970s and early 1980s, Dr. Ron Paul served on the House Banking Committee and was a key member of the Gold Commission. In 1984, he voluntarily relinquished his House seat and returned to his medical practice. However, Dr. Paul returned to Congress in 1997 to represent the 14th Congressional District of Texas. He served on the House Financial Services Committee and the Foreign Affairs Committee. As a member of Congress, he continually advocated for dramatic reduction in the size of the federal government and a return to constitutional principles. Dr. Paul is the author of several books and the recipient of many awards and honors from organizations such as the National Taxpayers Union, Citizens Against Government Waste, and the Council for a Competitive Economy. Dr. Paul lives in Lake Jackson, Texas with his wife Carol and, is the pr and they are both the proud grandparents of five children and 18 grandchildren. Please join me in welcoming candidate for President of the United States, Congressman Ron Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, and it uh, looks like a very nice crowd. My wife is up here with me today, Carol. <laughs> Sounds like to me that the spirit of liberty is alive and well in Charleston. Great. You know, it's, and it's nice to be down a little warmer climate. Yesterday, I flew up to Washington. I thought I ought to attend and vote against that increase in the national debt that you're going to get on $1.2 trillion. So it is nice to get back down and uh, and have this nice, very warm welcome. Uh, I always say that, you know, in Washington, when I give a speech, I never get applause, so I'm always glad to get out of Washington. <laughs> you know, you can get a more, better chance to get an applause if you're uh, telling the people the truth about what's really happening in Washington. And I think that's in the real tragedy. I think there's so much deception going on. Uh, and I, I think what's happened over the many years is uh, we have things turned upside down. The Constitution was written not to restrain you but to let you have your freedom but also to protect your privacy but what do we have they're always attacking your privacy they're trying to take over the internet at the same time they want more secrecy in government so I want to turn that around I want you to have your privacy and your freedoms
And it looks like the bill to stop the online privacy bill uh, is very stymied. It looks like by the help of many of you, we have been able to stop that. And uh, and it, it had and it did come from the energy from the people, the people who had heard about the bill where they wanted to really take over the uh, the internet. And ma many members of Congress responded. A lot of people had signed on that bill, and, and yesterday uh, they started removing their names from that bill. So when the people really decide they're going to speak out, uh, Washington will listen. Sometimes you need a two by four to get them to listen. <laughs> but uh, evidently numbers play a role in this, and I, I think this is very important. This is why I, in spite of all the problems I'll probably talk about here in a few minutes, I, I'm really an optimist because I think the people, and especially the young people, uh, are waking up and, uh, and, letting the, and letting the politicians know what they want. So I uh, have frequently been asked, uh, why do I think the young people seem to be attracted to our campaign? And I said, well, why not? They believe in liberty too, you know. So uh, it, it is a delight that there's a, a, a tremendous attraction for the views that I hold, and uh, I, I, we shouldn't be surprised at all. Uh, I'm always uh, surprised that we uh, don't have a lot more, but our numbers are indeed growing. I've been in this business for a long time, and, and the crowds were very small. But something has happened, especially in the last couple years. I think there's a recognition that uh, government's not a very good organizer or a management. They, they can't manage our, our lives, you know, they can't manage the economy, and they certainly can't manage all these countries around the world. I think we're getting sick and tired of what they've been trying to do. But the only thing they've been good at is running up the debt, and they seem to have no problems with that. But you know, yesterday, that, that vote on raising the national debt limit by 1.2, it was a real farce in, in many ways, because the debt is going to be increased. Last summer, the Congress gave up their responsibilities, and they said, well, the, when the president needs more money, he can raise the national debt. And we get to vote it down if we want to. And then if we vote it down, then uh, he can veto it. And then you'd have to, you know, override his veto. So it's a foregone conclusion because voting down the debt increase won't happen in the Senate. So the debt is automatically going up $1.2 trillion. Nobody seems to care. If they did, they would take my advice and cut the budget by $1 trillion in one year is what we need. But overall, our issue is that of individual liberty. That's what's uh, made America great. That's what the founders fought for. When you look at the Bill of Rights and the Fourth Amendment and the due process of law, I mean, it has been so severely undermined. If you take, if you take the bill that was passed shortly after 9-11, the Patriot Act, that hasn't given you any, uh, any more freedom. It's given you less freedom. I don't even believe we need the Patriot Act to take care of the people. Also yesterday, uh, while in Washington, I introduced a piece of legislation. It was uh, my typical, uh, very long, complicated piece of legislation. It was one page, and it says, <laughs> it says, repeal that provision in the National Defense Authorization Act that gives the president the authority to arrest Americans by the military and held indefinitely. I want to repeal that part. So in many ways, if you look at the 20th century, it was the unwinding of many freedoms that we had. There was a lot of prosperity created in the 20th century. We still have prosperity, but there's a big difference now. It's not based on productive effort and profits and savings. It's based on a belief that our dollar can be printed forever, and it's a belief that we can borrow money forever. So the wealth in this country is basically debt. Uh, the money is debt. Our wealth is debt. We're running the world on on debt, but there still is a bit of trust in, in the dollar, and the dollar is the reserve currency of the world. It acts like gold, but believe me, markets are smarter than governments, and markets eventually know that paper is not gold, and this is why the dollar will be rejected, and it has been rejected in many ways already. I got involved in politics in 1971 when the last link to gold was undermined and, and removed. Believing then that that would mean the politicians could spend money endlessly 
and have no responsibility, and that's exactly what has happened. Everything has exploded. If you're interested in economics, take your economic textbook out and look at the charts from 1971 on the size of government, the number of employees, the uh, inflation rate, the unemployment rate. Everything is exponential uh, from the early 1970s. But if you take a look at the value of your dollar since 1971, it went down 85%. So in a true free market economy where we want people to have the incentive to take care of themselves, they would work hard and save. They might not be sophisticated enough to, or willing to gamble in the stock market and these other things. But if they put their money away in 40 years ago and now they're going to retire, the money they put away has been gradually eroded. The dollars they put away in 1971 would be worth 15 cents. And this is criminal. This is immoral. It's bad economics. And this is why we have to pay attention to the monetary system, why we have to look to the Constitution, realizing the Constitution still says only gold and silver can be used as legal tender. There's no authority in the Constitution to print money, and there's no authority for the Federal Reserve System at all. But... You know, even, even short of uh, the time will come when we revamp and have a new monetary system or get rid of the Federal Reserve, the most important thing we do right now, and it supports about 80% of the American people because I can't imagine anybody being opposed to it, why doesn't the Congress demand to know exactly what the Federal Reserve is doing, how much money they're printing and when and where it goes and who gets all the benefits, and we should need a full audit of the Federal Reserve system. During the, um, during the crisis, uh, which is ongoing, uh, but when it burst in, uh, when the bubble burst in uh, 07 and 08, uh, the Congress went and passed TARP funds in the various programs and spent a trillion dollars. It sounds like a lot of money, and it is. And they bailed out companies and banks and, and transferred the debt from the corporations over to the people because we ended up owning, owning the bad debt. In the free market, you want to liquidate debt. You don't want to transfer the debt to the, to the innocent people. But what is generally not understood well is what was the Federal Reserve doing? They were involved in trillions of dollars, and we don't even know the exact amount. They were in involved with the manipulation of $15 trillion, and it's estimated about $7 trillion were used to bail out people overseas, foreign banks, and they're still doing it. They're sitting over there promising, don't worry, the dollar is strong, everybody can trust the dollar, and we will take care of the banks in Europe. It's the banks they worry about. They don't worry about the people of Greece or Spain or these other places because, of course, they live beyond their means too. They had a runaway welfare state and they had debt, but the banks bought the debt and now they're stuck with the debt. That debt should be liquidated. Now, if our Federal Reserve goes in and starts buying that debt as they have already started, that means even foreign debt is going to be dumped on us. There's a limitation to that, and the limitation is getting closer every single day, and that's why the burden will fall on especially the young people of this country and why it is so important that we understand the importance of liberty, property rights, sound money, and the responsibility of individuals to care for themselves. But you can't, it's very difficult to even, no matter how energetic you are, to take care of yourselves if you don't have a market type of economy and sound money and jobs. This is what you have to have if you're going to take care of yourselves. And this means the government has to change the environment. We're over-regulated, over-taxed. We have this manipulated monetary system. And let me tell you, there's a big drain on this economy for the things that we're doing overseas. We're spending over a trillion dollars every year overseas. And if I thought for a minute this would enhance and take care and take care of our national defense, I'd be all for it. But I tell you what, quite frankly, I think just spending money overseas is not an answer and will actually make us more vulnerable, especially if it contributes to the destruction of our currency here at home. So we should think more carefully about where we get involved overseas, how long we should be involved over there, and I, I have my position is quite frankly, it's we've been overseas in some places way too long. We don't need any more countries to occupy. And we need to come home from places like Japan and Korea and Germany.
But we can have a stronger national defense if we do. That is a prime responsibility of the federal government, to have a strong national defense. And actually, one of the things I can tell you is where we, as, as our, our government, has done a pretty darn good job. We have a military uh, that is superior to all the other militaries put together. We have more weapons and we're more capable. And believe me, nobody's going to invade us. And, uh, and we're quite, quite capable of telling us, t uh, taking care of ourselves. But it doesn't mean that we should uh, continue to spend money. I, I make a strong point that you should think about military spending being different than defense spending. If you spend money, say, in Iraq, fighting a war that was unnecessary, put, helping to put our debt, government into debt of $4 trillion, which has happened with military spending over the last four years, if, if you do that, that doesn't mean that we're stronger. That means that we're financially weaker. And who knows, we may have more enemies now than ever because, you know, there's a lot of collateral damage that we like to dismiss. But let me tell you, uh, it's not dismissed. When people get killed because we're occupying their countries, just think, I know the other night people didn't like what I said, but just think of what it was like. You know, if another country did to us like we do to some of them, wouldn't we be annoyed as well? So, so what is the advice and uh, how do you explain the point where they say if you endorse this non-interventionist foreign policy, does that mean you want to be an isolationist and you want to put walls around our borders and not talk or trade with people? No, really, it's exactly the opposite. We just don't want to occupy people. What we want to do is have a more open and free society and a mobile society. The very people who say that we who believe in non-intervention are isolationists are the ones who always want to put sanctions on countries. And sanctions are actually acts of war. I think it's time that we, you know, after 40 some, maybe 50 years now, I think we ought to think seriously. Don't you think it'd be safe to remove the sanctions against Cuba? Why don't we talk to Cuba and trade and travel to Cuba? We put sanctions on Iraq for about 10 years and bombed them con constantly. I mean, eventually it ended up in a war. And that war is far from over. I mean, our, a lot of our troops have left, but we have a huge embassy there. And uh, the, the troops will have to be there. So it will be a financial burden to us and a distraction from what we want to do. I complain about uh, all this effort. Uh, I've been When I was in the Air Force, I, I was over in that region, and I was right up to the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan. In. Very, very mountainous, uh, and, and uh, you know, it's just, it's just unbelievable how how mountainous and rough terrain that is. And the border uh, between the two countries run through there, and we're supposed to be involved in a war, fighting and chasing people back and forth, and figuring out who's in which country. But you know, my idea is let's forget about that border and worry about our own borders a little bit more. Our, our borders today are, are a real mess, especially to the south of us, and it's, it has immigration problems, and our immigration uh, uh, rules are, are, a, are a mess, and, and I, I can't go that, into that in detail, but it's obviously we need, we need better border patrol, and we shouldn't endorse illegal immigration, but there's something else going on on our borders that we should think about, because it is a threat to us, and, uh, and, and nothing seems to be changing. And that happens to be what's happening on our borders dealing with the drug wars. The drug war is really very visible down there. In the last five years, 47,500 people died on our own border. And it has to do with the drug war. So I would like to say that uh, it wouldn't hurt us to maybe put a moratorium on that, law, that war as well. <laughs> we um We've been fighting the drug war uh, substantially since the, since the early 1970s, spending trillions of dollars. And guess what? Prohibition doesn't work. It didn't work with alcohol. And it isn't working with drugs. I think we should rethink that. Your generation needs to rethink it. Because when they, a, a previous generation decided that we were going to make people more moral and teach them that alcohol is bad for them, which it is. It's a really very dangerous drug, as all drugs are. And uh, yet they tried 
the prohibition mess, method to mold people. They did it for 10 years or so, and then they decided, oh, it didn't work. So they woke up one day and they repealed it. Today, this one's been going on longer. It's, it is much, much more complicated. It's been more costly. We fill our prisons with nonviolent criminals. You can get put in prison for being a nonviolent user of drugs on three occasions for life. And I would suggest those people who have done the murdering and the raping shouldn't be getting out and we shouldn't be putting nonviolent drug users in prison. The other, the, other question, uh, the other question we ought to ask is, uh, it seems like we uh, accept the idea that alcohol must not be a drug, and if you're addicted to alcohol, you're treated as a patient. As a physician and a person in politics, I would suggest that people who are addicted to drugs, instead of encouraging them to kill and murder and rob in order to get enough money to pay about a thousand times more for the drug, why don't we treat people who are addicted to drugs as patients rather than as criminals? Not only, not only is it a failed policy, but it also does something to our liberties because it's an excuse for people to come busting into houses. I'm sure you have heard the stories of the, uh, of, of, of the police departments and the federal government, the FBI, busting into places with, who are suspected of having drugs. But guess what? They go into the wrong houses sometime and tear up the house and then they walk off and, and, uh, and, and leave the people in distress. Some people get killed that way, you know, uh, by, uh, by these sting type of operations. So it's a very, uh, and it's used to undermine, as an excuse now with the Patriot Act to use search warrants, uh, I mean search without search warrants. So in order to really protect our privacy and restore the Fourth Amendment, you have to deal not only with with the Patriot Act, but also the uh, downside of the of the war on drugs. But what 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 are some of the things that we must do in order to get the economy going again? And there's a lot that we have to do. They say. My viewpoint, does that mean the government should do nothing? In some areas, yes, we should do nothing, like telling people how to spend their money. I would like to think that we shouldn't tell you how to spend your money. But there, there's the environment of the economy that we have to deal with. We have to have a sound currency. We shouldn't have a, a currency that's constantly losing value. We shouldn't have a Federal Reserve System that creates the booms and the busts. We shouldn't have these programs that uh, tell, uh, tell the businessman that they must give loans to people who can't qualify for loans, contributing even more so uh, to the boom cycle. We should have low taxation. The other night they asked me what I thought the ideal tax would, would be on income. It didn't seem like a complicated question, so I gave him my uncomplicated answer. I thought the income tax should be zero. <laughs> People working their way through college, you know, if there were more jobs and you didn't have any taxes, it would be a lot easier to work your way through your college. You might not have to borrow so much money. You know, and it was close to that when I went to college. It was the taxes uh, uh, were essentially nil at that time, and there were jobs. The jobs didn't pay very much, but guess what? The education didn't cost very much now. But when government gets involved, whether it's in housing or education, they want everybody to be educated, and more people might get educated, but when and they just pump money into anything, whether it's houses or education or medicine. Guess what? The number one thing that happens, the price goes up. The, the cost of education, the cost of medicine, the cost of houses, and distorts the economy, and then there has to be a correction. That's certainly what happened in the housing bubble. But right now, the most important thing that we have to expect, try to do in order to get the growth back again is you have to liquidate. You have to get rid of debt, and you have to get rid of malinformation investment. Because when, it, when the Federal Reserve lowers the interest rates lower than they should be, it encourages savers and business people to do the wrong things, make mistakes, and borrow too much money. So if you don't liquidate the debt, you just can't build on that. And unfortunately, in the last four years, like I mentioned before, they didn't liquidate the debt. They transferred the debt. They transferred the debt from the people who made all the money and gave the debt to the people who are losing their jobs and losing their houses. So 
what we need is a clear understanding of the free market economic system. And unfortunately, uh, uh, we have been engaged in this country many, many decades, if not 70 or 80 years, being taught only one form of economics, and that's been the Keynesian economic interventionism. And believe me, people in Washington, the bureaucrats and the politicians I know, aren't smart enough to tell you how to spend your money and run your business. <laughs> But, but the, our whole system thrived on the principle of individual liberty. I am, my belief is that our, our life comes from a creator and our liberty comes from our creator and that we ought to be able to assume responsibility for ourselves and not be hindered by our government. The one thing, uh, it, uh, what happens if you live in a truly free society, then you have the chance of assuming the responsibility of uh, seeking excellence and virtue. That should be the goal in life. Excellence and virtue and prosperity and uh, yet when government decides they're going to make you virtuous or they're going to make the economy perfectly equal believe me they ruin things they ruin things they can bring about equality in economics but the 20th century has shown what total socialism brings equality of poverty is what you get so in a free society it's quite different but it becomes a more creative society we were the freest and the most prosperous and we had the largest middle class ever. Now the middle class is shrinking, Pro productivity is down, but there's no slowing up of spending. None whatsoever. And this is the reason, you know, I've made this modest suggestion that if it's the spending is the problem, instead of tinkering around with how do you raise the debt limit and deceive the people, we should cut the budget by a trillion dollars. I think that's a pretty good place to start. But freedom at one time was seen as a unit, and the founders understood this. If you had a right to your life, you had a right to your social life, and you had a right to your economic life. Today we have a few people defending personal liberty and a few others defending economic liberty. But you need to put this back together. If you have a, a right to your life and your liberty, therefore your social life, as long as you don't hurt people, uh, then you, you have a right to do what you want to do as well as how to spend your money. And some people say, oh no, some people are going to waste their life. They're going to do some dumb things, and we got to take care of them. I had one member of Congress, we were voting on something, they're t putting controls on the people. And I said, why are you doing this? I said, Don't, uh, why should you regulate and tell people what to do? And they said, they're stu too stupid. So this is their attitude that they have to tell you. But it is true in a free society. If you have your freedom, you might make mistakes. But the whole thing is, it's better you make your own mistake and suffer the consequence than the politician making the mistakes and everybody's suffering. So we, if, we, if we could bring people together, and this is to me the wonderful message of freedom. It brings people together because some people will use their freedom in one way. Sometimes it will be wasteful. But you don't endorse people's use of freedom. The limit is use of force and stealing, hurting other people's property. But you don't endorse it. We understand this in religion. People can be atheists and they can be all forms of religion. And this country generally respects freedom of choice. And they may make mistakes. But in, in social things and economic things, all of a sudden we think we have to regulate them. But we, we need to have a better understanding and not feeling so threatened. Just because we legalize freedom, that doesn't mean we endorse it. If we endorse what people do. A lot of people would like to paint me as being pro-drug or something. I'm not. You know, It's just that I'm pro-choice on people allowing to use their own lives, but I condemn you know, some people uh, on, on their choices. But I'm willing to believe that a free society is the most prosperous society. That's what made America great, and that is what is going on in this country. Believe me. The crowds are bigger. The young people know about it. The remnant is still out there. People are getting excited, and they know change has to come. The only question now is, are we going to march forth with continuation of gigantic growth of government worldwide and have the United Nations taken over? Or are we going to demand our rights as individuals to live in a free country where we don't have to be dictated by international government, where we don't go to war under the United Nations and NATO, and that we live as free people in this country as it was intended? Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you. Okay, we'll see what we can do with questions. Okay, great. Congressman Paul has agreed to uh, respond to questions as he is able. We have a few Bully Pulpit Series event staff stationed around, so if you'd raise your hand, they'll get to you um, as they can. Here, we have one over here. Do they have mics? Okay, here we go. Yeah. Considering the nature of the Bully Pulpit Series, my question deals with communication. I would use the powers of the Bully Pulpit as President of the United States. He asked, how would I use the bully pulpit of the President of the United States? Uh, probably give the same speech I gave you today. <laughs> <laughs> the message is, imp is important, but understanding is important. We talk uh, for many years in the uh, support that I've gotten about a revolution. It's an intellectual revolution. But nothing works if people don't understand it. Government reflects the people. There is no doubt about it. And they have to understand it. So just like I mentioned about the change in attitude about the, uh, the the piracy bill on the internet. The people knew and understood that. So you want to galvanize people and get them excited to put pressure on the people in Washington. We don't have to change every single person in Washington. What we have to do is change your hearts and your minds to know what you expect from government. When that happens, we don't hear that very often from very few of our leaders, that it's the change in people's minds that have to count. But government is a reflection of the people. If the people People want us to go to war under UN banner and not declare war and occupy more and more countries, the government will continue to do it unless you decide as a generation enough is enough. If you want your, your rights back again and your assumption that you can take care of yourself, we, we have to hear from the people. That would be something that I would keep pushing to try to get people to understand. The one thing about the free market, people say, well, it's cruel and it's evil and uncaring. But it, it, actually it isn't. It's humanitarian. If you care about your fellow man, you want freedom because it produces the most and gives you the largest middle class class and the greatest prosperity and one of the best distributions, although there would be inequalities. But people, when they hear this, they should be encouraged, and uh, that would be a message I would continue to spread. Dr. Paul, in regards to uh, the SOPA and PIPA bills currently in Congress, our South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham is a co-sponsor of PIPA. In my uh, interactions with him through emails, I feel a lot of the politicians speak a different language than the voters. As a congressman, what would you suggest we tell him in regards to the bills so he fully withdraws his support from PIPA? Well, obviously you, you need to tell your representatives uh, what you believe, and if you disagree with the bill, you tell them you disagree with the bill. Now, if there's two or four of you, uh, it's not going to do any good. Uh, just yesterday, um, uh, Rubio switched his vote. He took his name off because he heard from his people. And uh, a lot of people in Washington aren't philosophically interested. They're interested in re-election. You know, that's what motivates most of them. It's re-election and power. But uh, no, if there's enough people that send that message, uh, they, they should have the, you know, uh, you know, change their minds. That's what, that's what the system is all about. So all I would do is encourage to contact all your representatives who do not agree with you on SOPA. Here we go. Congress, Congressman Paul, my name is Mike Topser, and I'm a sophomore poli sci major here at the College of Charleston. Uh, I have a quick question for you. In 2009, you signed uh, a letter of de from the Texas de Congressional Delegation uh, requesting uh, support from the federal government uh, for high-speed rail in Texas. I was curious as to what your opinion was towards high-speed rail and American infrastructure in the United States uh, being a promoter of small government. Mm -hmm. limits, I think. Well, um, I don't recall that particular letter, but it's, uh, it's something that I would sign and make requests. I, I represent a, a district, and uh, they take a lot of money from all our districts. They take highway funds. It's a, the best example, and that's probably a, you know, a highway transportation bill. So it, uh, highway funds were supposed to be a user fee. We pay for 
for gasoline. We send the money to Washington. It's supposed to build our highways. But they go and spend the money on the wars. There's no money in the bank, and then they have to appropriate money. And I routinely, if there was any request from any city, town, or individual for infrastructure, I would just, uh, you know, uh, automatically make the request and say, you know, you took the money that uh, we have these monies come back. And they're, and they're called earmarks. And this is a, this is a contra controversial issue because I believe in the principle of earmarking. I don't, because if you vote against an earmark and, 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 and don't support it, the money goes to the president and he gets to spend the money. And I think that's wrong. Matter of fact, I think there should be more earmarking. I think that everything, every nickel should be designated how the Congress, because we represent the people. So we should designate this and, uh, and, and we, we, should, uh, we should do this because that is our responsibility to designate how the money should be spent. But the one thing is, since I've never voted for an appropriation bill, I've never voted for one of those earmarks. So I might make the request saying, look, if you're going to divvy up the money that you stole from us, yeah, I, I would at least let, let my, my request be in there. I wasn't a participant in the, in the sense because I automatically vote against all the bills because the money wasn't there. It was just adding the debt, adding the debt to it. So that's my position on issues like that. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Um, I know you don't want to occupy any other countries or break down our relationships. Do you have any plans to strengthen our relationships, um, particularly with Pakistan and Iran? Um, she knows I don't want to occupy more nation, but what can we do to strengthen our relationship, in particular with uh, Pakistan and Iran? I do not believe, um, yeah, I would continuously do that because I would want to offer friendship and trade with anybody who will accept it. Um, and that would be the opposite of, of punishing the people of these countries. Like in Iran, now we're putting punitive punishment uh, and not allowing them to import or export, which is, act, you know, is an act of war. Uh, so I wouldn't do that. I would take off the sanctions uh, because it, it backfires on it. It hurts the people. It never hurts the government. Matter of fact, it, improve, it enhances the power of the government because there's a lot of people in Iran right now that don't like their government. And they actually have elections. The American people don't realize it, but they, they, they have a lot more elections there than they do in Saudi Arabia. And, you know, and we do whatever Saudi Arabia wants because they uh, you know, do what we tell them to do. So you should offer friendship and trade, and you say, well, some of these people are bad people. Yeah, like uh, didn't we uh, talk to the Soviets when they were killing hundreds of millions of people as well as China, but eventually we got over this. So we should talk to people. And a bit, one example that I've used frequently is the crisis when I was drafted in 1962 with the missile crisis uh, in Cuba. And, um, and, and Kennedy and Khrushchev talked, and they decided they wouldn't start a nuclear war. And we took missiles out of Turkey and took missiles out of Cuba. And, and uh, we didn't have to have that war. So I think we need more diplomacy and more talking and uh, not more intimidation. Pakistan is the example of, of the worst type of foreign policy we could have. Because I used to claim there were two job options. We go to a country and we say, look, we want you to be our buddy and you our dictator like Mubarak and give him 40 billion dollars and look what what happened there so if they do our bidding we give them a lot of money if they don't do it then we bomb them and occupy them but in in Pakistan we have we have an, three ways of doing it we, we bomb them, kill innocent people, they get angry at us, they get angry at their government, and we keep giving money to the government. And uh, then we wonder why we don't have good relationships with them. Now, the founders were right. The more trade uh, and, and communication with people, the less likely we're to fight with them. And I, when I was in high school, we were fighting the Chinese. So I was delighted when Nixon decided to talk to them. And just think of what was achieved in, in, uh, in Vietnam. The French and the Americans probably killed over a million Vietnamese. We finally left. We lost 60,000 Americans. Hundred, many of them are sick and injured people. Finally, we leave. And guess what? There was no communist domino effect. What happened was they became westernized. China became our banker. And we invest in Vietnam. All achieved through peaceful bands and not you know, war. This is why I think we should be talking to people, whether it's Pakistan or whether it's the Iranians or whatever. This does not mean you have to condone what they do. And if they are a threat and they have nuclear weapons, I don't want anybody to get any more nuclear weapons. I don't want the Iranians to have nuclear weapons. But we contained the Soviets. They had 
like 30,000 of them. So the last thing we need is a war in Iran over a weapon they don't have. Dr. Paul, I have about three comments. One, I would like to see term limits for congressmen and senators. If they can accomplish anything, they should be able to accomplish it in the time allotted to them. They don't need to make a career of being in Washington, switching from this to that, and taking big money from the big oil companies, the big pharmaceutical companies, and big insurance companies, big, big banking consortiums. We need to make our own decisions. Those big companies do not need to make them. We need to get rid of the lobbyists, and we need to deal directly with our representatives. And I think you're absolutely right about drugs. I know this is very unpopular, yeah. but if we made drugs legal, we would get rid of all the crime involved. <laughs> And like alcohol, we could make them legal, clean out our jails, and collect tax on them to help on this deficit. Thank you. Okay. See, didn't I tell you that people under 30 have good common sense? Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Under, um, with term limits, uh, I, I introduced the first term limit bill even in the 70s when it wasn't even a subject. Uh, we had a chance to vote on term limits in the 1990s after the Republicans took over in 1994. And we had about six votes. I voted for all of them. So I support term limits, but I don't think it's the answer. Uh, it, it would be helpful. But ultimately, if you, if you have somebody who believes the same thing and they leave and you put somebody else in who believes in the foreign policy and the monetary policy and the Federal Reserve and, and you know all the bailouts it doesn't change anything but what I think you're suggesting is the turnover you're going to get a better chance uh, of doing it and that's why I support it but unfortunately we're not on the verge of it it was sort of after we had those six votes in the 1990s it was passed by so I guess the uh, the second uh, the, your second option to that is is the people that aren't responding to you you know there's still such a thing called an election and and you have to work harder at that, I guess. Okay, uh, which way are we looking? <laughs> we'll entertain one more question. Okay. Dr. Paul, on uh, Monday at the debate, when asked what was the highest income tax you would have, you said zero. Totally agree. I think it's direct theft. And I don't think the American people understand how you would get the taxes, whether it be user fees or tariffs or what. Could you please elaborate on that? Yes. Okay, he asked about, um, he likes the idea of a zero tax rate, and I think most of us do. But he asks a, a realistic question, how do you get there? Because obviously if we had no income tax right now, uh, the deficit would get worse. So you have to change uh, the spending habits. We have to cha literally change the role of government. If you want a perpetual welfare state and you think we should police the world, no, income taxes are going to go up. The inflation tax will go up because uh, the people aren't, they don't have the jobs to produce enough, so they're just going to keep printing money until the whole thing blows up. And that's what I'm worried about. That's like to happen. But if let's say we are more sensible and we can work our way out of it, how do we get to a zero tax? Well, what you do is uh, you have to bring our troops home, not be the policeman of the world, have a strong national defense, and then uh, you have to say that we're not in the entitlement system. Today, uh, most people in this country, or at least a lot of people in this country, think that entitlement, it sounds like it's a good word, like you have a right to it, but entitlements aren't right. You have a right to your life and your liberty, you don't have a right to keep what you earn. But you're not entitled to somebody else's property. So you have to change that whole philosophy. 
But up until, uh, up until 1913, we didn't have an income tax. It was user fees. I think, I think the user fee on the highway, you, we could work with that. We have a user fee. I, I have a lot of coastal area in, uh, in my district. And, you know, in the Intracoastal Canal, they pay fees uh, for, uh, to use it. But then somebody else uses up the money. And then, then, they, then they, we have trouble with taking care of our harbors and our, and our canals. So user fees would be good. A highway gasoline tax, I think, would work under these circumstances. Uh, but the big thing is cutting back on, on the size of government. But, but uh, some, some taxes, uh, uh, the, the import tax uh, isn't, you know, real popular. But if an import tax raised revenues at the very beginning of our history, but when it's punitive, when it punishes people and tries to protect certain industries, that is bad. But if you had a, a flat tax, I, I think that would be a proper way of raising some revenues if, if we want to avoid the income tax. Anyway, that looks like our time is up. I enjoyed it. Wonderful day. Wonderful weather. Thank you very much. Congressman Paul, thank you. And on behalf of the Bully Pulpit Series at the College of Charleston, I'd like to present to you a token of our appreciation. How's that? <laughs> well, what a crowd. Thank you all for coming today. And on behalf of the series, the nonpartisan series, regardless of your vote, we want to remind you to vote on Saturday during the primary election. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. So you get the front row seat. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Let's see. I do. I got one. It has to be a sharpie. Wherever you want. Well, if this is okay, I'll do it right here. That is great. There you go. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Very good. Thank you. Um, I, I didn't bring anything special, but could you just uh, design right here? No, sorry. When the young people come to my office in Washington, I hand out constitutions. I tell them, you guys read it because nobody reads yeah, it in yeah. Washington. <laughs> there you go. Who's this? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Paul. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank Appreciate you. It. It's going to turn a couple of times. I'll get you good. I have to do it out here. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. You're welcome. Go all the way. Thank you. Thank you, you guys. Glad you're out. Sorry. Take the pen. Sorry. There you go. Thank you, Doctor. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Good luck. Hey, Aaron. Yes, sir. That's fine. Thank you. Fantastic book. I'm sorry. One of the few things that I compliment Nixon on. <laughs> that was one of the good things. Good to see you guys. Can I get a picture with the College of Charleston shirt? Thank you so much. Here, where are you? Oh, yeah. Let me, let me get that one. Here we go. Hey. Does that make me an honorary member? Oh, yeah! yeah. Oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> sure can. Thank you. Yeah. Good to see you guys. Yeah. Can I get a picture with you? Okay, yeah. if we can work it. Can you take a picture with me? Uh, sure, I'd love to. You press that top one. Uh, all right, this one. Smiley and... There, there we go. Thank you so much. Yeah. Mind if I get a picture? Uh, we can try. Right here, right here. Right here. Shake your head. As an Air Force right. medic and a veteran myself, thank you very much for coming. Yeah, it's good. good. Appreciate that. Right. I just want to shake your hand, really. I love what you do. Thank you. Yes. Really. Good to see you. Thank you for your hard work. Sir Paul. Sir Paul. Thank you. Paul. Thank you. Paul. Thank you. Paul. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. If Iran closed the street, how would you respond? 
Well, you know, the odds of them closing it, it would penalize them more than anybody else because they need it as much as anybody. <laughs> They're just retaliating to say, think it over before you put sanctions on us because it might get messy after it. But they're not, even if they had a weapon, they're not going to use it because they would be destroyed. Because Israel, the United States could they destroy them in a day. Close it though. Huh? They have threatened to close it. I know, but, but, but we've also put on very, very tough sanctions. So they're retaliating verbally on what we're doing to them because we're trying to undermine their, their whole system and they're going to suffer from it. But they're just saying that we might have some recourse. But, but it, it, would, it wouldn't make any sense from their viewpoint either to do it. Also, They've never done it before. Also, um, you have gained support from the uh, leader of Stormfront.org. Um, the website is a neo-Nazi-based website. Yeah, there's going to be like a Not really. I, I don't know. Oh, good. Okay. Well, they, they, but I don't. They I, you know, some days, just one day I had 47,000 new donors. I don't look up any of their names or find out what they believe in. If they send me money or support me, they do it for what I'm saying. And, what I said here today. So I cannot, I cannot be a judge. I do not make judgments of people sent me money. If they're bad people, I'm glad to get the money out of it. I don't want, I, I don't think, I think I should stop. Hey, great to see you. I work at Husk Restaurant and we would love to have you come down. I'd love to have you come down. I can set up a reservation for you and your wife today. I just don't even know my schedule. Anyway, good to see everybody. Congressman Paul, what do you think about Texan, your fellow Texan dropping out of the race. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I'll have all his wins. There you go. What's the stance on the Endangered Species Act? What would you say to young people who don't want to show up? Uh, they don't want to show up. Why? Who don't care about politics? Who don't want to go and vote? Oh, I don't worry to him about it. You don't. You don't. You don't want to try and get them involved. Sign up. Oh, I do. I can. I kind of. That's what I do today. And if that doesn't do it, then I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. I can. You know. I try to energize them with ideas, and I've been successful doing that. Why? People who aren't interested, it's because they're bored with the ideas. I think I can energize them with ideas of liberty. Why is it that, that you have such an appeal to college students, to young people? Because they care about they care about liberty, and obviously, and they like to be their own people. <laughs> okay, I know you've been across this repeatedly, but the BBC. Why do you think it is that young people seem to be going for your message? They like freedom. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Paul. Good night. I want a picture. Okay. Dr. Paul, are you still here? Dr. Paul, get out of here. Right here. Hi, hello there. And I'm studying economics. What are we doing? I'm going to go this way. Okay. Right there. Got it. All right. Very good. Dr. Paul? Thank you so much, sir. It's a pleasure to meet you. Good to meet you. Good to meet everybody. Great. Thank you. Here. Uh, what do we hope? I, I'm going to have trouble. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of enthusiasm, Dr. Paul. Sure is. Thank you Delightful. so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Here, give me a second. Jonathan. This is, this is a young, right, young lady over here. This is the first one, huh? Can you watch that out of the Can you watch the sign? Thank you. Can you watch the sign? Thank you. I don't know. I'm running out. I'm out of ink. Yes, it is. Just ran out of ink. Thank you. Can you sign both? And I'll love you forever. <laughs> and I'll love you forever if you don't. So. That's a long time, you know. <laughs> All right, sir. Ah, oh, they tell me I have to go. Okay. Out of ink. Thank you, Dr. Paul. There you go. Thank you. Paul, Thank you. 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 We gotta get a picture here. How are you doing? Got it. Okay. Very good. Okay. Very good. 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 Very good.
Okay. Honored to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.